Okay, I'm here today with Michael Sanders. He's the Chief Operating Officer of MIA, the Minneapolis Institute of Art. How are you doing today, Michael? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you? Wonderful. I am uh, really excited to have you here today. Uh, so, you know, Michael, maybe if you could uh, take 60 seconds, two minutes here, and just give us a background uh, uh, on your career and kind of how you got to where you are today. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so I actually started in museums uh, almost exactly 20 years ago. I actually started my career at the Science Museum of Minnesota as a gallery interpreter, um, kind of worked my way up there into uh, management level, um, mostly in operations and visitor service. Uh, from there, I went to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, wonderful organization in Cleveland, Ohio, as their director of operations. Um, I was recruited away from that job to go to the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium in Dubuque, Iowa, as the executive director and COO. Um, I did that for a couple of years and then moved back to Minneapolis to work at an organization called the Bakken Museum, which is a multidisciplinary museum that focuses on science, the history of science, a little bit of history, combination of art and, and science. Um, I did that for six and a half years as the CEO um, until uh, just six months ago, actually six months ago, exactly today, that I started as the chief operating officer here at NIA. Well, awesome. Well, that's that's a... a quite a circular ride there to get uh, to get back to Mia. So let's talk Mia. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the, the Art Institute? Yeah, so uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art, we uh, rebranded uh, several years ago as Mia, and uh, we're an encyclopedic art museum that uh, um, has been around for well over 100 years. We've actually been on this site and in this building since 1915. Um, and so uh, when we say encyclopedic art museum, we are a museum that shows art from, uh, displays art from different eras, uh, um, from uh, thousands of years ago up until contemporary art. We have uh, art from different geographic regions of the planet, everything from Asian, and we're especially known for our Japanese art collection, to uh, European art, uh, South American, Mesoamerican art. Um, we have art, uh, we have paintings, sculptures, textiles, uh, you name it. As, a, in, as an encyclopedic art institution, we have over 100,000 items in our collection. So that's uh, Mia in a nutshell. Wow. Well, so, you know, obviously during the pandemic, museums suffered uh, pretty much anywhere where people had to visit suffered. So coming out of that, uh, you know, how, how's business going and, and what are you doing to, to kind of connect with the community again? So, yeah, uh, museums were not unique in, in having uh, pandemic, pandemic related issues. Um, clearly affected our visitorship as it did with all kinds of organizations all over the, the country. Um, we um, weathered the pandemic, I guess, as well as we could have is uh, obviously a hardship for everybody. We're not back to the visitorship that we had pre-pandemic, but we are ramping up, right? So we reopened uh, officially uh, as of last spring. We have, um, we're seeing currently about a little over 60% of our pre-pandemic visitorship. Um, but pre-pandemic, we were at the highest visitorship that this organization has ever seen. So um, one of our best years was 2018. So we are in the process of trying to re-engage the audiences. And one of the ways that we're doing this, and again, this is not unique to our organization, is by bringing in some of those larger names, those, those bigger exhibits, those kind of art exhibitions that, that draw a broad audience. Um, and the exhibit that we have coming up is Botticelli and the Renaissance Florence. Uh, it's called Masterworks from the Uffizi. Um, highlighting Botticelli and, and uh, that era of art in Italy, which um, even if people aren't familiar with uh, Botticelli as a name, everybody has seen some of these iconic paintings uh, uh, that he has done. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And you know, part of the reasoning behind that is that we're realizing that emerging from the pandemic that, that folks may be hesitant to go to a place like this, or maybe it's just something that they haven't done in a couple of years. And we want to invite them with some of the, the greatest works that they could see, and also to remind them of just how amazing the experience can be when you go to an art museum, how inspirational that can be, how, how organizations like MIA and other art museums and museums of all kind connect us with the community, connect us with history, um, can inspire us and, and really kind of you know, incite that creativity within individuals. So, um, we're excited to be reopened and re-engaging our audiences, and we're kind of building back from what has been for our industry a, a rough couple of years. Well, first of all, that's great to hear. It's great to hear it's, it's coming back, and I think it's absolutely incredible that you're, you know, you're bringing such a, uh, an iconic uh, uh, opportunity, you know, to, to, to the market. And, I, and so how long does a show like that run for? 
This one will last um, from October 16th to January 8th. Um, and so uh, just, a, just a couple months, it's an opportunity for, for folks, uh, and not just in this region, but uh, everybody to come to, to MIA. We're, we're a free museum. There is an upcharge for a large exhibit like this, but coming to MIA is always free um, for folks. Um, so it's, it is an opportunity. It's a limited opportunity. This is not a traveling exhibit. It is coming from Italy to Minneapolis, and it's the only place it's going to be, and that goes back to Italy. So a uh, very limited opportunity to see some of these works that, that frankly, almost never leave the Uffizi. So um, if you want to see these and, and not have to fly to Italy, um, as wonderful as a visit to Florence is. Um, I was going to say, I, I, I might go to Florence, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're all looking forward to going to Florence. But um, <laughs> You know, uh, sometimes getting to Minneapolis might be a little easier. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. So, uh, you know, I've got to wonder, you, you've got such an eclectic collection. You've got a lot going on at the museum. You're bringing in these large exhibits. H how do you keep, how do you keep the team aligned? How do you keep them bought in and up to date with what it is that you're doing? Yeah. So I think it's, it's important um, for me. And I, I've, you know, learned this over the 20 years in, in the industry that, um, you have to create buy-in early, right? And it's not just some of the obvious things when we talk about the curatorial research or the exhibit design and development process. I mean, those things obviously have to, to begin at the start of this and, and are the formulation of, of creating some of these wonderful exhibits. But even, you know, the staff that, that may not be as obvious in the planning process, those, those staff who take it over and kind of keep things running as an exhibit goes. So you're talking about the visitor service staff security staff, those folks who may touch it through events or the retail departments, um, your facility staff, you know, the key staff that keep the organization running, having them involved in the process and kind of touching it along the way, giving their feedback about how things go or maybe how things like the front desk should be aligned and um, different retail items. Doing that early and creating that buy-in early is crit critical to, to making sure that an exhibit or it could be other types of projects, maybe facility construction project or, you know, a strategic plan. All of those things that are large sort of big picture things that impact the museum and everybody in it. Having those staff in early in the process um, to have their feedback um, helps create buy-in for them when they have to take these processes over and, and interact with the visitors and keep the facility running and doing those critical things that make museums what they are. That's, first of all, that's awesome. Uh, you know, second of all, how do you, how do you go about having these conversations? Is it like, uh, like a survey? Do you walk around and talk to people? Do you hold forums? How does that work? Yes. And yes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, it is kind of, it has to be just by its nature, it's multifaceted, right? So there's, there's things for some of these positions, you know, think about security that they're on the floor, right? And so there's not an opportunity to take them you know, for two hours off of their, their critical security duties and do like a strategic planning session. It's not, it's not always feasible for every position to do that but in the same way that maybe a curator or an administrator uh, would be able to take that time. And so you have to meet those folks where they are. Um, and sometimes that might be, um, as you said, uh, designing a separate process for them. It could be, you know, maybe it's easier for some of these folks to do it over Zoom. Um, frankly, we've all kind of learned to do it. Some of us like like it more than others, frankly, but, um, but you know, some of these things where, where you are uh, involving them on, you know, not just the, the, the meetings and the small group sessions and things like that, but it can be everything from uh, written feedback to, yeah, surveys. And I think surveys are great, but surveys can be limited as well. Oftentimes you just hear from um, the voices that are most passionate about things and you don't necessarily hear from everybody. Um, so again, you have to meet them where they are. Um, and get the feedback and kind of really have to seek it out. So it's a process and it involves some work from then the leadership staff to make sure that you're finding ways to get every voice heard. So people share their voice. You know, how are you listening to that, right? Like, how are you consolidating these opinions from all these different directions, um, you know, and, and, and pushing them, you know, to the next step? Yeah, what are you doing? To, what are you doing to consolidate all this? I will reference back we did a process um, last year at my previous job where we did a strategic planning process where we, we really shifted it from being a top-down leadership and board member process to a more bottom-up, starting with the feedback from the staff, right? And so we did a series of conversations um, starting big picture um, and thinking about like, what is working well and what, is, what are things that you want to address? And then using that in a re refining process where we then as leaders are taking their feedback 
interpreting it and, and, and then bringing it back to him and said, this is what we heard you say. Here's, here's not just the laundry list, but how we heard it and how it might tie in then to our strategic plan and then getting the feedback again and them saying, yeah, that's what we we're saying, or this is really what I meant. And so you're kind of refining it along the way until you're honing down into those key points then that can be part of a strategic plan or a departmental work plan. Um, and so that's a process that I used before in one of my previous jobs and that we're doing here at MIA um, as we're doing our new strategic plan and turning that into individual departmental work plans. So you ask the question, you listen and refine what they say. And I love the part about going back in and just saying, hey, look, this is what I heard. Is, yeah. Did I hear this right? I mean, because that is that is key because they may have said I'm sure that you also get people that say things and then when they hear it back, they're like, it's not exactly what I meant when I said that, uh, you know, let, let, let's maybe tweak this. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and I think there's, there's also parts of it where you get you say this is what I've heard. And that then springs maybe another idea. Right. And so like the whole process then becomes sort of creative and iterative um, as you go through it. And again, these are folks that work most directly with the visitors or with the facility um, or with the security systems. And you're going to get ideas from the people that work with it on a day-to-day -day basis that you as a leader or as a board member would never have thought of um, because they do have that lived experience and they do are experts in their own roles. So I think it's, it's invaluable as you come up with these plans. Hey, absolutely. So, I mean, you, you've always heard it, right? If you ask the question, you have to be able to uh, be ready to do something with the answer, right? Right, so exactly. So what happens next? So you've, you've, you've refined all of this feedback. What happens next? Well, I, I think, you know, you can do all the planning and surveys and, and small group meetings and breakout sessions, but unless you turn it into action, then, then it's just noise. And in some cases, you know, when you do surveys and then you don't turn it into an actionable item, um, in some ways you, you lose trust and that's even worse, right? And so I think probably all of us who have been in hospitality um, or in museums or uh, arts and culture institutions over the past 20 or 30 years have seen this somewhere along their career, right? Where we were really into data and analytics and wanting to get as much information as possible. And so we do things like surveys, staff surveys, membership surveys, and send things out like, um, you know, having, having folks in the lobby who are asking questions and getting feedback. But unless you turn that into action, um, you, you, you lose trust, right? It's very easy for staff to see, well, yeah, that's all great, but we spent all this time doing it and nothing came about, right? So um, I think that, that turning it into the action step, and for us then it's the turning it into, these are the actual work plans that we intend to do over the next three years. Um, and we're, we're all gonna be held accountable, me as a leader. And then as we go through things like appraisals and our weekly meetings, we're gonna be checking in on these, these work plans and what is our progress? What do we need to change? So. Um, I think that's important, that critical step of like, yeah, we have the information now. What do we do with it? Um, and then actually doing something with it. it that's, uh, you know, first of all, that's spot on. Um, can, can you think of a, maybe an example where, you know, you you receive feedback from the team and, you know, it pivoted your your uh, direction or your course of action or how you proceeded? Yeah, there's actually... Um, there's been a, a number of things that we didn't think about here at Mia when we're reopening to the public about, you know, the journey mapping that you do. And this is probably all through different areas of the hospitality industry, right? Where you do journey. Yeah. Mapping. Um, and thinking about things from the front end about like, how, how do our audience approach this, this building and then interact with say the lobby area um, and hearing the feedback from our staff about how the visitors in the lobby choose their wayfinding and where the pain points are, where the structuring, this is an old building, right? Um, built in, the original part of it was built in 1915. And so wayfinding is a challenge here. Um, and we felt as a leadership team that we had a good handle on that. Um, we understood this. We all have been in the museum. We have friends, we invite tours and things like that. But it wasn't until getting the, the feedback on the front end from the visitor service staff about like exactly like this, this is the challenge. This, this, this hallway here isn't intuitive or this, you know, how people approach the, the, the cafe in our lobby um, and where the, you know, the queues start to form and things like that, that like, frankly, I would not have thought of. Um, and I'm the operations guy, right? So it was, <laughs> you know, it's important for us to think about that and because, you know, there's all kinds of research that shows that th those kind of things impact a visitor's overall experience in a museum um, in ways that, yeah, you can have all the great art that you want, but if they can't find what they're looking for and they're frustrated, um, that then is a negative experience. And some, it's really 
easier to lose trust than it is to gain it, right? So you have to take care of those, those really sort of low hanging fruit kind of things that you can address like the wayfinding. And um, when I say wayfinding, everyone usually thinks of signage, but it's more than that, right? Because right. signage is not the cure all for everything. And anybody of in the course. hospital industry knows that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, those, those are kind of examples of just recent things. These are the last couple of weeks that we've been doing in our process. So um, every part of it is eye opening. That's awesome. So, so what does that do to the the feeling of empowerment for your team? Like, what what do you think that? How does that trickle down to them? Well, I you know I can tell you what I hope it does. Um, but I you know I, honestly I can't I can't speak for everybody. But I the feedback that I I have heard from staff is that um, they appreciate having their voice heard. Um, that, that historically in organizations like museums, um, that hasn't always been the case, right? And I think there's there's been a long history of museums having sort of a, um, a, a top-down approach to how they do things like exhibits and how they do, you know, just general leadership. And you think about just the history, it goes back to the 1800s, right? About how museums are structured and, and, and uh, how, um, you know, curatorial work was structured. Um, and changing that is a process. And it's a process that is still happening, right? Where it's definitely not a finished product. Um, but I think, Part of that then is engaging with the staff, building the trust um, and, and being willing to change, right? And, and not just, as we said, just talking about it and asking questions, but really taking the action step. It's like, okay, no, we heard you. Um, but it's also just as important to say, we can't do all of it now, right? But here's our plan. And we want to begin to address some of these things. Um, museums like ours, we're a nonprofit, right? Not unlimited resources. And so we have to, take these things and prioritize them in a, in a schedule that we can actually accomplish. Um, because again, it's easier to lose that trust than to gain it. And if you overpromise and you don't do those things, again, you're back to square one. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a moving target and it's, it's challenging. Um, and especially coming out of the pandemic when there's just so much that's unknown in our field, um, it's, it is challenging. But I think those are the exciting challenges, right? We can do something better with these guys. Um, so I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's absolutely awesome. So I, I hope that everybody, you know, listening to this today really took that, you know, took that piece away from there, right? Is that, you know, if you get your team involved early and you get them involved often, and then you listen, actively listen and, and refine their communication, and then finally make sure that you're doing something with that information that you're getting, uh, you know, you're going to create a ton of buy-in from your team and, and you're going to be able to make sure that they're, you know, pretty much uh, uh, enlivening and 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 sharing that vision that you're that you're creating together, you know, with the client, with the with, with the visitors, with anybody who's coming to your business. Yeah, I mean, it's it's critically important, right? And and again, we're at a point with museums where we want to engage more people. Um, museums have a traditional audience, right? And and I think it's great to to get those folks back after the pandemic. You want to engage those audiences, those people that are really passionate about art. But we also know that there are people who would love to come to an institution like this, but maybe don't see themselves as being welcomed um, or that they don't necessarily belong in an institution like Mia. Um, and I think there's also staff, right? There's the same thing with our hiring processes. You know, um, museums for a long time have been very monochromatic, right? It's, it's um, there's a challenge in getting diversity among our staff, especially leadership staff and curatorial staff. Um, so as we approach this sort of holistically about we're listening and we're trying to get the best ideas from our staff, we're being more inclusive on this end. Um, and from those ideas, especially from those staff who work most directly with visitors, that maybe we can be more inclusive. Maybe we, there is that, that sense that people who traditionally haven't seen themselves in museums now feel more comfortable because we have become more welcome because we're listening to people. Um, I think that can help improve museums. And again, it's a process. This is something that's not gonna happen overnight. <laughs> museums have a long history and people probably have pretty ingrained ideas of what an art museum like Mia is. Um, but these are things that if we're dedicated and we take the time and we listen, I think that we can change. And like I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that museums can be better. Well, I, I think you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, you know, I always like to kind of wrap the show up, right? And, and, and talk a little bit about kind of what's coming next with leadership. So for you, you know, Michael, what kind of advice are you giving new leaders that are joining your organization these days? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think for me, I look back on some advice that I got when I was moving from sort of a mid-level management position um, to a more director level position. I had a, 
a, a really knowledgeable senior vice president who gave me the advice of just surround yourself with great people. Um, and that means, you know, as, as a manager, as a director, as you move up in leadership, you clearly have some hiring decisions to make. And so you can, you know, make the decisions on that hiring process about, you know, what we're looking for as far as teamwork and, and knowledge and skills. But I, I also think it's important that as a professional, especially as maybe a young professional or somebody new to the field, to understand that on the front end, when you're interviewing for a job, that you're also interviewing that organization. And so surrounding yourself with great people means the management that you're going to work for or an organization with their leadership and their board of directors. Um, surrounding yourself with great people who are, are great teammates, who are collaboratively, who are knowledgeable and flexible and, and willing to uh, approach different ideas. I think that's the best advice that I ever got. And um, I'm hopeful that maybe it helps other people, um, especially because I've been telling people that for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's a great piece of advice. And, and you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, when you take the time to surround yourself with great people, you know, everything we just talked about, about creating buy-in, I mean, that's your retention right there. You surround yourself with great people. It's it, it's one thing to do it, but you have to keep them around, right? Yep. Um, and so you seem to have a great loop and a great uh, uh, process here for not only uh, surrounding yourself, but also retaining the talents you have around you. Yeah, and it's been a challenging time for that for everybody, right? There's just a massive amount of turnover in all kinds of fields right now. As right. People are rethinking their professional life, their work-life balance, their their professional goals. Um, you know, do they see themselves working from home now, right? A museum is a place where a huge number of these jobs are tied to the site. We're, we're a destination, right? Um, and so it becomes challenging then as, as there's just a lot of flux in the marketplace to bring in people. But we're finding that people are still very interested in working in museums. We still get lots of applicants for some of our key jobs. You know, I just hired a, a direct level position um, that had well over 80 applicants. Um, I hired a coordinator. I had 146 applicants for that position. Wow. So there's, there's still big demand for some of these jobs. Um, I know that's not universal in all positions right. and in all areas of the hospitality field, but I think um, as we can approach it, and, and again, seeking out those those folks who um, maybe have been up underrepresented in museums and finding different ways to reach those folks to bring them in and start building their careers. Um, but also, again, going back to the advice, by just you can surround yourself with great people. The hiring process is really important. But then keeping them means doing those things that make them feel included, make them feel welcomed. Um, and I'm passionate about that. I would say I'm not perfect at it, but I'm continuing to learn. <laughs> Well, that's all you can be, right? As long as you're passionate about it, you make it a priority. Uh, you can you can see it happening in the future. I love it. Yes. So, Mike, you know, Michael, uh, if people wanted to get a hold of you, uh, track you down, uh, you know, are you on any of the platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, anything like that? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. So you can just feel free to look me up. Uh, Michael Sanders, Minneapolis Institute of Art on LinkedIn. Um, and that's that's probably where I'm most active professionally. My, my other social media, I'm, I'm pretty bland. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I can tell you it's probably the only one I work on I, as well. So uh, so uh, that's how to track you down. If people want to find out more about Mia and, and, and all the wonderful things you have coming up, where are they going? They can go to our website. That's artsmia.org. Awesome. Artsmia.org. I love it. Well, Michael, this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck with the exhibit. Thank you, Chris. This has been real fun. Talk soon. All right. <laughs>